Hi everyone, thank you all for coming back to the channel. This is just a quick preface to this video. I'm really excited in this video to be interviewing Dr. Chris Lovejoy. Now, Chris actually runs live kind of tutorial webinars for those who are interested in learning more about machine learning as it applies to healthcare. Now, because most of my viewers are medical students, healthcare students, or obviously students interested in healthcare and medicine, he's very kindly offered to give my viewers half price on the next event that he runs. I'll leave the details in the description below, but it's a two day event. If you use the code PGM2020 at checkout, you can get each day for £15 or £25 for both days. It's a staggeringly good deal and really, really generous of Chris to offer it to us. So once more, that's PGM2020 to save 50% off Chris's next machine learning in healthcare event. Details in the description below. Without further ado, guys, enjoy this new interview. Okay, hello everyone. Um, welcome to this video. This is a new format uh, here for this channel, but amidst coronavirus lockdown, it seems only um, prescient to interview people from afar. I'm delighted to be joined today by Dr. Chris Lovejoy, um, a clinician working in machine learning and data science alongside, I assume, his various clinical responsibilities. Hi, yes, that's right. Nice to, nice to talk to you again, Oli. Perfect. Um, so I think Chris will be a really interesting guy to interview for the channel. It's one of those areas, um, you know, when people say, what can you do with a medical degree? I'm not sure that many people would jump out working in data science and machine learning as, as an obvious avenue. Chris, do you just want to summarize who you are? What do you do? Sure. Um, so my name's Chris. I am currently, uh, for people from the UK, I'm essentially in my F3 year which what that means is I've completed my full time at medical school, uh, which was six years. Um, and after graduating, I then have worked two years as a doctor, done what's called the foundation program in the UK. Um, and I decided to, so F3 is kind of a year when people sometimes take a bit of time out, maybe go traveling, that sort of thing. I decided to do like a fairly geeky uh, F3, which is to do a master's degree in data science and machine learning um, at UCL in London. Um, and essentially the, the rationale for that is I've been kind of increasingly interested in um, kind of data, uh, the use of data in medicine, uh, maths, and uh, I've always been quite interested in, yeah, interested in, in, in applying maths to healthcare problems and decision making and, and, um, and that sort of thing. So from during medical school, to be honest, I started getting involved in different sorts of projects related to applying machine learning to healthcare and applying um, data science principles to analyzing health, how we diagnose, how we make decisions, how we operate hospitals, that sort of thing. And have basically gone a bit further down that rabbit hole over the last three years or so. Uh, and now I'm fully fledged kind of studying the, the algorithms behind machine learning, studying a lot of the mathematical principles, um, really enjoying it. And in the process of trying to figure out how best to apply it to healthcare. Um, doing various different sort of projects uh, alongside my my work as a doctor and trying to um, you know see where this technology and, and these skills can be useful, but uh, still in in the process of of figuring it out at the moment. Um, so it will become staggeringly obvious during this interview that a lot of this a lot of this science and these concepts are way beyond me. Um, so for as much my benefit as the people at home. Um, what, what is machine learning? Yeah, so um, essentially machine learning is a group of techniques that can be used to achieve artificial intelligence. Um, and the way that artificial intelligence is often defined is the pursuit of uh, doing something that requires human intelligence by something that we wouldn't class as human, so like computers. Um, uh, yeah, I, I kind of mashed that definition a little bit, but essentially that, that's the idea is that uh, we're trying to make computers do something that we would traditionally consider to require human intelligence, and that can be in many different domains. So that might be things like teaching it to play chess or teaching it to play Go, um, of which those are a couple of the sort of landmark um, advances in artificial intelligence. Um, or it might be learning it to, teaching it to recognize pathologies on chest X-ray, um, to recognize um, patterns in blood tests that might predict someone's going to deteriorate clinically, um, and a whole host of different applications in the healthcare space. Um, and yeah, fundamentally, uh, the majority of machine learning that's applied in healthcare, at least at the moment, is what's called supervised learning. 
And what that just means is that you give examples to the computer and you tell it, these are examples of this and these are examples of that. So for example, these are examples of a normal chest X-ray, these are examples of a chest X-ray with pneumonia. And then the machine then does the learning um, to understand, well, what is it that distinguishes between the two chest X-rays? And you can identify, okay, well, maybe when there's a bit of patchiness here, that creates this class of pneumonia. They don't really have a conception of what pneumonia is or what that means yeah. or anything else really about it, but they understand that you've given them a status that, that says this is pneumonia, this one's chest, uh, normal, and then it will learn how to distinguish between the two. And um, the, there's been various advances kind of within the last five years or so that are all quite exciting um, and have enabled this sort of technology to do things that actually we didn't really necessarily think it would get to the point where it could. Um, that's fueled a lot of hype and excitement in the area. And now there's a lot of developments and a lot of research going on, a lot of companies being formed around trying to apply machine learning to healthcare and um, hopefully a lot of positive impact on patient outcomes and, uh, and health benefits for the population generally, both in developed countries like the UK uh, and the US, as well as in um, developing countries um, where they maybe don't have access to healthcare in the same way. Uh, there's a lot of yeah. cool ways that we can uh, potentially use machine learning to, to help overcome those um, kind of inequalities as well. Amazing. So, so just so I understand, I'm going to try and rephrase some of this. Like, so let's say... Um, you or I, if, if we looked at an x-ray, we could maybe have some inkling with a clinical history and blood tests and so on and so forth that this person has pneumonia and, you know, th this x-ray has consolidation or haziness or whatever we might see. But you're saying that this algorithm has no concept, medically speaking, of what pneumonia is as an entity. So is it purely looking for differences in the image that you give to it, is that right? Exactly, so I mean, it, to be honest, it depends a bit on how you train it and what exactly you do. Um, a lot of the studies that have been done so far have literally just looked at chest X-rays. Um, so there was discussion about how maybe we can combine it because as you said, in a clinical setting, we don't just look at the chest X-ray and make a diagnosis based on that. We look at the blood tests, we look at the clinical picture, um, like we examine the patient, that sort of thing. Whereas what a lot of the studies are trying to do is look at this very kind of n narrow domain um, performance, which is if it just looks at the chest X-ray, can it get the diagnosis right? Can it find the signs that are relevant for one disease or another disease or the absence of a disease? Um, and yeah, there's, I mean, there's, so there's been some critiques of whether or not that's an appropriate um, way to approach it because it is missing some of the information. But then a counter argument is, well, if it can perform pretty well with just the images, maybe then it can actually perform even better if you incorporate other features and, um, you know, there's a potential for, for even, even better performance. Amazing. So yourself then as a, uh, let's say, as, a, as a, a pioneering researcher in this sort of field, I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would call myself a pioneering researcher, but thank you. You're very kind. My my uh, my, my question ultimately, I, I think a lot of people, um, particularly existing medics, have this concern. Is the end goal of of these sort of studies is it to produce a um, an adjunct diagnostic tool, or are we trying to create something that can replace or supersede a clinician? What what's the um, you know, the, the motivation. Yeah, so I think in any industry, there's always this discussion of, you know, we're introducing artificial intelligence, um, it's becoming increasingly capable. Is there going to be a point where it replaces the, the workers? Like, is it the point where it replaces humans? Um, and you see a lot of papers um, where essentially what they're trying to show is that their algorithm performs at the level of humans or exceeds humans. Sure. But the key distinction with all the work that's been done so far, um, is that it's always in a narrow domain. So it will specifically be an algorithm looking at chest X-rays or an algorithm looking at skin lesions or an algorithm analyzing blood tests and predicting the chance of developing sepsis, for example. Um, so certainly if all it's doing is, is narrow domains, there are many, many, many domains to medicine. Um, so with that approach, it's unlikely that it's going to supersede doctors and it's always going to be an agile. Of course. Yeah. Um, from that perspective, like it's going to be, you're going to have all these useful tools. So it might be the case that when you analyze your chest X-ray, you have an extra um, kind of interpretation that goes alongside that. It might be the case that it 
fits the most in the pipeline so it might triage those chest x-rays before you then do the analysis so that the ones that are more likely to have a serious pathology get reviewed earlier and that's something that's being trialed in the nhs at the moment um right. or yeah it, it could be uh that, that it's a, a useful tool so it analyzes blood tests and predicts patterns for you but there's a lot of steps of abstraction from being able to perform well in these narrow domains and provide um prediction tools or uh, diagnostic support tools, there's a lot of steps from going to that to actually replacing everything that a doctor does because there's so much that we do in that pipeline. Um, yeah. And elements of it do involve pattern recognition, which is what machine learning is very good at because it's very good at spotting these patterns from large volumes of data. But if you think about what, what does a typical doctor do? So if I work in an A&E shift, um, every patient that I see, I will kind of initially talk to them, take a history, uh, is there going to be an AI that can that can take a, a history um, to the standard that a doctor can? And obviously, there's that emotional, empathetic, ele em empathetic element, yeah. which uh, I can't personally see AI replacing that in in its entirety. And if we're talking about empathetic AI, we're kind of going quite far down the the rabbit hole of um, yeah. you know, does AI have emotions? And um, maybe roaming into the kind of consciousness territory, which is uh, it's kind of a whole, a whole other kettle of fish, um, uh, a whole other discussion in itself. But yeah, essentially, um, at least on the horizon, we are only really looking at kind of adjuncts um, and replacing like narrow domains in that pathway. So the I didn't go through the full, full pathway, but I think you get the idea of you initially talk to the the patient when they come in. You then kind of think about the signs. You pick out the salient features. Um, sure. You then process those kind of in a slightly algorithmic way in your own head with pattern recognition from yeah. past cases that you've seen um, and build a bit of a picture in your mind, come up with an idea, um, take in a lot of actually cues that would be very hard to feed into a machine, machine learning algorithm because sometimes as a doctor you just get a sense of, you know, what type of patient is this? Like, are they the kind of person who are going to downplay their symptoms or upplay their symptoms or are they somebody who... Um, you're just going to interpret one thing in one way or another way. And those are all things that are quite hard to quantify and quite hard to feed into an algorithm, but they're all things that we can learn to do kind of as humans. So, sure. yeah, I mean, that's, that's a very long answer to your question. Um, and I don't think I've like fully answered it, but at least in the next couple of decades, I think what I, it's hard to see that there'll be anything more than um, an adjunct in very narrow domains. And we might see an increase in the number of domains in which AI is being used. Um, but the hope is actually that that will just free up more time for doctors to be able to do what's um, kind of more important and what doctors can excel more at, which can be things like spending time with patients, spending more time making complex decisions. Um, and there's a great book by someone called Eric Topol called Deep Medicine. And, and the argument that he makes is that actually AI could give us the potential to have that free space, have that, have that time, and just bring a lot more empathy back into medicine. Because one of the critiques of the introduction of electronic health records um, and some of the digitization aspects of medicine is that we have, as well as all the kind of targets imposed on us, is that we're losing a bit of that kind of doctor-patient interaction. It's becoming a little bit more... Um, what's the word a, li a little bit more kind of routine and and less um less empathetic essentially a bit more clinical <laughs> so just to then bring things back a little bit so um thank you for that about that i think that was a really good explanation of of the machine learning and the data science side of things i've not thought about that actually taking the cognitive load um off physicians in that way to to actually give you more time spent with patients that's a really important aspect which I'd never um, never thought about so my next set of questions is more about you and how you you entered all of this so how far into medical school or maybe it was even once you became a doctor you know you decided data science is is going to be is going to be my thing now um, wh when did all that happen so I think um I initially kind of had the inclination or, or the idea that I was going to be doing, trying to look to other things that could combine with medicine in interesting ways from probably my penultimate or maybe my final year at medical school. Um, I was very interested in the, I enjoyed the clinical side of things, but I was also very interested in the kind of academic side of things and also just um, 
particularly the scalability aspect. Uh, so, and what I mean by that is, I've always been interested and driven by having like a positive impact, and I've always felt that I wanted to have like the kind of maximal positive impact that I can um, in my sure. short space on the on the planet, and and um, with my yeah finite number of years, that sort of thing. And one of the critiques that has been made of medicine um, is that you obviously you're, you're having a positive impact but in terms of the positive impact that you have the limiting factor is the number of patients that you can see and you're never going to be able to scale that up in a non-linear sense like it's never going to exponentially scale um, so in a shift on a and &E, I might see 10 patients um, I might get really skilled and maybe I'll see I don't know 12 patients 14 patients and if I get really skilled I can start making those decisions quicker and and um, you know, get better at communicating and get, getting better at finding the right diagnosis and increasing my accuracy of diagnosis, that sort of thing. But I'm kind of like limit, topped out at like that sort of number of being able to treat these patients safely in this space of time. Whereas with some of the kind of like what, what sound like perimedical fields, uh, there's a much greater potential for scalability. So for example, if you look at academic research, um, let's say you come up with some new idea um, and what's a good example? So let, let's say um, a surgical risk calculator that is better than previous sure. surgical risk calculators. And it leads to people making better decisions about whether or not to have surgery. And that leads to improved health outcomes. That is not limited to the patients that you're seeing in front of you. Let's say that gets scaled up internationally. And even if it leads to a 1% incremental improvement in decision making, that could be thousands of lives that you've saved. Yeah, over time. Yeah. So, so you make that argument with academics, with, with academia. You can make the same argument with, say, let's say, pharmaceuticals. Um, if you develop a drug um, before it would otherwise have been developed, or in, maybe it was never going to be developed, uh, then you can have a huge impact. So, for example, like discovery of antibiotics is an extremely high yield, extremely scalable discovery um, sure. because of all the, the disease that's enabled us to treat. Um, and within that realm, I would consider kind of data science and machine learning to fit in there because if you contribute to a machine learning algorithm that's then incorporated into a clinical setting and leads to an improved patient outcome, then yeah. you have done something that potentially could scale internationally. And while the impact might be incremental, if you take the incremental impact kind of globally or on a large scale, then the positive impact that you're having just scales up significantly. Um, so that, that was kind of like a big driving thing for me to be looking for other things related to medicine, like in this, yeah. in this sort of like perimedical space. And there was various things that I kind of considered in that space. Um, so I've been a bit interested in startups um, and I did work at a startup for about a year or so, um, kind of part time along working as a doctor, alongside working as a doctor. Um, and in that startup, it was using data science and machine learning. Uh, and then I've kind of looked a bit more into the academic side, so uh, applying machine learning to healthcare research and seeing what sort of um, tools can be developed and, and what sort of research you can do to see how, how we can kind of you know, lead to that improvement um, in outcomes in that context. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah, as I said, I mean, I'm still very much on this journey and trying to figure out exactly where my skill set lies best and, and where I can get that combination of positive health outcomes with things that I'm interested in um, and things that I'm good at and mm -hmm. things that I have time to do. Um, and yeah, it's still early on in that journey, but uh, in, the, in the process. Well, that, that, that leads me on to my next question actually, which is that I think if you asked most members of the general public, maybe most medical students, um, to be fair, you know, what's the, what's the career path of a doctor? Most people would say, well, you go to medical school and then you work for a few years as a doctor, maybe, and then you pick your specialty. Yeah, you know, and then you do that for the rest of your life. Um, it doesn't sound from what from what you're saying like uh, like that's necessarily the. Um, it, it seems like you're kind of shaping what you want to do as you go to a, to a point. How flexible is medical training for that? Yeah, so, I mean, I think definitely that's like the conventional paradigm is that it was pretty much the, w the way to do it was once you get into medical school, you're, you know exactly what you're going to be doing pretty much every year. Um, and typically people would go to medical school, go straight into foundation program in the UK or an equivalent abroad. 
um, then specialty training, then become a consultant, um, and that's kind of your career trajectory. I think, that, I don't think there's anything wrong with that, um, but we are seeing more of a shift away from that, or at least more people are doing things slightly differently. And partly that's because it's become a bit more acceptable. So it's become like the eye of an F3. Um, I think this might be a UK specific thing, but uh, essentially more and more people are, after they do the first two years out of medical school, they then take a year out, do maybe no medicine at all, maybe a bit of kind of local medicine and, and then go traveling. Um, and if you look at the statistics for that, it used to be a very, very uncommon thing to do. I think 90% would go straight through the training, and now it's yeah. more than 50% will take a, take time out, do an F3, yeah. sometimes then take a subsequent another year outside of a training post. Um, and I think that's representative of a shift, a slight shift away from the kind of traditional route of always progressing through training. And in terms of the ways in which you can do that and the different sort of careers that you can combine it with and the different sorts of things you can do, I think that's still largely, it's not set in stone. There's a lot of different things that you can do that might be interesting and useful in some ways. Um, definitely data science machine learning seems to be picking up, but there's still relatively few doctors that are kind of pursuing it, um, or at least to, to kind of the level of going into, into further education or something to do that or... Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there are, there are, you know, it's an increasing number, but it's still, it's still very much a minority. Um, and in my case, I wouldn't advocate that, I don't think everybody should be trying to look for alternative routes. Um, I think there's not, there's nothing wrong with just kind of progressing through training and just enjoying your medical training and that sort of thing. Um, but I think in some cases, people kind of progress through training because they, feel that maybe there's not like a clear alternative or they're not too sure what they would do if they didn't progress through training. Um, and maybe there's a kind of bit of fear of stepping into the unknown of not knowing exactly what you want to do and, and how you're going to, um, you know, make money or uh, have yeah. a job or how you're going to spend time doing this and maybe put up with your parents telling you that you should go into training uh, and that sort of thing. Um, which I think for people in that position, who maybe have some interest that they haven't had the opportunity to kind of really um, develop. In those cases, I would always err on the side of saying that it's better to take time out and just really kind of uh, pursue maybe what's interesting for you or what, what you're inclined towards or just pursue things that are of your own interests and then see maybe somewhere down the line you can combine that with medicine in like a novel way. Yeah. Um, one example I often bring up, uh, which is like a slightly left field example is that one of my friends is is really into music um, and particularly into like hip hop and rap. Um, and he's a final year medical student at the moment, um, but he has, he took a year out of medical school and he's doing a lot of, um, a lot of creative work exploring hip hop and rap as a medium for let's say medical education. Um, sure. So kind of trying to convey some of the the human sides of, of patient experiences and how they relate to doctors through through rap and through hip hop, um, and also trying to use it as therapy. So um, he's done a lot of work with people with kind of certain mental health problems, so like anxiety or depression, and using music as a way to empower them um, and help them to express themselves. Autis autistic people as well, he's worked with, and there's a lot of like really interesting potential ways in which this kind of like targeted therapy yeah. can then like really make a huge impact on these people's lives. And that's not something that like, obviously it's pretty unconventional. Um, and there's not a clear career path for that. But yeah. I think if, if those are your two interests, uh, and you want to look for ways to combine those, I think it's, it's super interesting. It sounds like he's made it work. <laughs> Okay, cool. And then the last question, um, or maybe subset of questions, depending on, on where this goes, is you released a book. I would have um, brought it here. I'm actually lending it to someone who's now received their, um, he received his medical school offer recently, and he's currently got it. So reading it in, in preparation for medical school. Um, so uh, for, for the boys and girls at home, um, what, what's, your, what's your book about? Yeah, so um, so this was a book I wrote, to, I started writing towards the end of medical school and I finished it in my first year as a doctor. And the, 
the motivation behind the book was, I mean, so initially it kind of started out, my sister was starting medical school the year that I graduated. So I kind of wanted to give her some like advice um, as like an older brother and um, kind of initially I gave her a bit of verbal advice and I was like, you know, what, I'm going like, to like, think about it and just try and write down like what I think are like, the key things, key takeaways for medical school. Yeah. Um, it then kind of like evolved a little bit and it started, became a bit of like a kind of personal reflection and like trying to get my life lessons uh, and like everything I learned from medical school down down on paper. Um, and then, yeah, it then kind of evolved a bit more from there and turned into like a kind of fully fledged, like structured book looking at some of the different um, aspects of, of medical school. And broadly, it, it's a bit of a blend of um, like tips and tips and tricks for like performing well in medical school. So the first few chapters are like, how to how to study efficiently some of the principles of effective yeah. studying um how to communicate um effectively um and how to become good at like the clinical sides of medicine so and what i mean by that is like doing examinations taking histories those sorts of things and just as many tips as yeah. possible to do the best you can in medical school whilst also having a bit of like doing it as efficiently as possible so you have a bit of free time to then you know socialize and and do other things and then the second half is a bit more of a, um, I want to say like kind of philosophical aspect, or I think that's kind of maybe like flattering myself a bit too much, but but it's kind of looking at, um, you know, how should you consider, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chapter on like impact and looking at scalability of impact and how you can look to enhance your impact as a doctor and um, yeah. have a, have a posit greater positive contribution or as, as a greatest positive contribution as comes back to what you were saying before, I suppose, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's very much kind of like just espousing my, my thoughts on that and, and like kind of trying to look at it through like a kind of analytical lens of quantifying the impact of doctors and quantifying yeah. impact through other specialities and, 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 th and through other uh, ways you can uh, combine medicine with other things. <laughs> Perfect, that's a good answer. Um, so f for reference, everyone um, watching it and listening, so this will go out as a podcast as well. It's a really, really good book. Um, and, you know, I read it at a time because I would have still been, I guess, getting towards because I'm, I'm in the same year as your sister, obviously. And I read it then. And, and admittedly, I read it from a position where I thought, you know, I'm, I've done a degree. I know how to study and uh, and all this and that. And there was just stuff in there that I'd never thought about before. And, and I still use, you know, going through medical school now. So it is a really good positive impact text. Um, I'll put a link in the video description. Um, for where is it just online how do people buy it yeah so um so the name is modern medical student manual uh so you can google that and it is available on amazon um and then i also have it available on my personal website as well if you go to okay. chrislovejoy.me so www.chrislovejoy.me then it's also available there perfect um so yeah guys if if you you're a medical student, maybe, you know, pre-med, you've just got your offer and you're starting in September, fingers crossed, um, as this situation goes on, or you're in your, I was going to say pre-clinical years, but even getting into your clinical years, I would say there's good advice, good advice in there for anyone. Um, or if you've got someone medical in your life, perhaps you're not a med student yourself, I'm sure there'll be stuff of benefit. Thank you very much, Chris, um, for, for coming on and spending the time. Um, it's been really interesting. <laughs> thank you for the invitation yeah it's been it's been really good talking to you yeah not at all um so links to all chris's social media and his website and everything will be in the video description i really encourage you to go and check out the exciting stuff that he's doing um and we can all we can all take away the lessons for our own personal and professional development as they would have us say um okay thanks very much chris take care take okay care. no problem thanks bye Thanks for watching guys, there are three ways you can support the channel. The first one is to like, comment, subscribe, share this video with a friend, just enjoy it generally. Second, you can buy me a coffee if you found it useful using my Ko-Fi link which will help keep me awake during the editing process. And then thirdly, you can use my referral link to save 10% off your first year of Complete Anatomy 2020, my favourite 3D anatomy learning tool. Take care guys and I'll see you next time.